Okay, those of you who've been listening to the podcast for any time now know that I'm really big on people focusing on the journey, not, not getting caught up on the destination. Today's guest is going to share with us a very interesting article that caught my eye in Backpacker Magazine called, I Don't Want to Hike the PCT, and That's Okay. Our guest is vegan food and travel writer and photographer, content creator, and founder of Terra Drift. Alicia McDars, welcome to Papa Bear Hikes. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Alicia, let's start off by telling us a little bit about you. Absolutely. Um, I'm a, like you said, freelance writer and photographer. I specialize in the outdoors, uh, especially where sustainability in the outdoors is concerned. Um, I have a blog and YouTube channel that I run with my husband, which is terradrift.com. And um, I write freelance for mostly outdoor and travel magazines like Backpacker. Um, I started backpacking I believe my first trip was when I was about 10. Uh, my dad took me out. And um, of course, I haven't been doing it nonstop since then, but it did get me started early um, in a love with a love for the outdoors. And um, in my adult years, it's it's been pretty, pretty nonstop with camping and road trips and backpacking and uh, and that sort of thing. So I just love to play outside. Alicia, your first trip was at 10. And this is a conversation I've had with people. I have three adult children, three boys. And like myself, I, my first trip was at seven. I had my kids out there as young as I could. And I like to tell parents, if you get kids out there when they're young, they might seem like they've lost interest at some point. They might reach that point where they get into high school and it's just not cool to hang out with mom and dad anymore. But the chances are really good that at some point they're going to come back around and say, you know what? I want to go back and do that. I had a lot of fun doing that. Oh, absolutely. Um, there are so many photos um, in our family albums from when I was a very uh, moody teenager of me just like in a bucket hat off in the corner with like baggy jeans sulking by a lookout point because I didn't want to be there hiking <laughs> with my parents and my sister. Um, you know, I think because they started taking us camping when we were so young and then backpacking, um, you know, at, at some point in my life, I was like, you know what? No, I like this. I can see, um, the benefits of it. And I, the older I've gotten, the more passionate I have gotten about um, backpacking. And to, to this point, like my dad, who has been, and still is backpacking, um, he, he started when he was in his teens or early 20s. Um, he has claimed long ago that I have, he, he doesn't claim to be an expert. Um, he always defers to me with any backpacking questions. Whereas I look at him and I'm like, but you've been doing this for decades longer than me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yes, it, I think um, and my parents are very glad that, you know, I, I left the sulky phase and <laughs> came back to it because now um, almost every summer, the last few years uh, we've gone on a, a backpacking trip together, um, my husband and I and my parents. So it's been really a fun thing that we've gotten to do together again. Yeah, because I just, I know my own experience that, you know, vacations could be fun, but they could be a lot of stressful. But I think the most memorable, the most bonding moments are the ones we've had in the outdoors. You know, Absolutely. I just hiked a, a big section of the Tahoe Rim Trail this summer with my 30-year-old. And it was over. I even told him, I said, you know, I'll never forget this. I said, you know, and he goes, no, I won't either. This was great. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I got to, um, my husband and I, Josh, backpacked uh, rim. No, we didn't do rim. <laughs> we did rim to rim with my parents a couple of years after we hiked just down and up the, the south rim, um, just Josh and I. And so when we, when my parents were talking about going back, we sort of, said hey if you want some company we'll come with you but you have to go rim to rim <laughs> um and getting to share that trail that we had already fallen in love with like the the bottom of the grand canyon is just the most magical place and getting to share that with my parents was just the coolest and very special experience 
Yeah. You know, when, when we bring children into the outdoors, it's happened to me. I'm watching it with my my children and obviously happened with you. Your parents pass that on to you. It That, pa that passion just, it just keeps, it gets fueled and that fire just burns hotter the older you get. The more, you know, you just want more of it. It's true. And I'm a very passionate person to begin with. So when I am um, interested in something and I care about it, I am very quickly all in if it matters to me at all. Now, Alicia, you wrote this article for Backpacker Magazine and struck a chord with me because I think sometimes we can get caught up in goals. Um, I've, I'm a backpacker. I've got to hike one of the big three. I live on the East Coast, right? So I've got a, and a question I get asked frequently. Am I ever going to through hike the Appalachian Trail? And my response is, I doubt it. It doesn't make me any less a backpacker than people have through hiked it. And I've been doing this for 50 years, but I don't feel like I need to. In your, so I want to talk about your article, which is titled, as I said in the beginning, I don't want to hike the PCT and that's okay. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was, uh, you get it. Like you've, you've gotten the questions too. And I, I so feel <laughs> that pain of um, usually people who aren't fully immersed in the backpacking world, I think are the ones generally asking that question because they're, these big three are in sort of the, the more mass consciousness of, okay, well, backpacking, here's what I know, this trail, this trail, this trail. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it's sometimes you're like, no, no, I haven't hiked it. I don't know if I ever will. Um, and it's always sort of irritated me because yeah, it, it, you almost feel like less of a backpacker because you haven't done those. And I've struggled with that for a long time, especially as a, an outdoor writer and photographer. I'm like, yeah, is that something I have to do? Um, is, is it a necessary resume thing? So I finally got the chance to join a friend who just finished hiking the PCT this summer. Um, I joined her for a small section in Washington for just a few days, but I met her for PCT days and we hung out with through hikers for like three days. And then we hit the trail for three days um, and then camped a couple more days altogether. I was on the trail or near the trail and with through hikers for a week. And um, I was sort of using it as fun hangout time with, with her because uh, as a woman in the outdoors, like you just cherish your friendships with other women <laughs> who are into the same intense things that you are. Um, so I went out there just to have a blast with her, but with the sort of simultaneous goal of getting a closer look at what it looked like to through hike a trail like the PCT and what the experience was kind of like. And obviously, you know, like a week being out there, it's a very small glimpse, but because we were there for PCT days and spending so much time with so many other through hikers, you got to sit around with the stories and hear the tales and the, the struggles and the celebrations. And it was so much fun, uh, but it sort of opened this window to where I could see through and sort of touch and feel and taste and be like, okay, I see what this is. And I now can decide better and be informed in that decision of whether or not this is something I feel I want or need to do. I interviewed somebody about a month ago who set out to through hike the long trail in Vermont. And after a week said, you know what? I'm not a through hiker, but I had a good time out here for this one week. And I kind of went through the same thing when I did the long trail. I walked away saying, you know what? Two, three weeks. That's kind of my threshold when I start missing home. My wife doesn't hike, neither does his wife. And that played into it as well. Uh, they don't hike or backpack. And yeah, you know what your threshold is. And we do this because it's fun. Now, that's not saying people that through hike these long trails aren't having fun, that they're not enjoying it. But I also know firsthand, having talked to people I've met while I've hiked sections of the AT, they're not all having fun. And some of them, especially out here on the AT, they reach Massachusetts, somewhere between, I'd say, New York and even Vermont. 
where they're just pushing through so they can get the Katahdin and finish it up. And I ask myself, you know, in my book, I talk about this. You are they really having fun if if they're pushing themselves just to finish up? Absolutely. Yeah. I, and some people are into that, you know, like um some people are very driven by goals and metrics and data and um checking something off the list. Uh and that's totally fine. I know about myself though, and it sounds like you're very similar that that's not how you enjoy backpacking, um, how I enjoy backpacking. So I think that I would struggle, especially because I do tend to be goal oriented in the way that I want to get to the end point. Like I don't like to waste time. <laughs> I want to move. I backpack quickly. Um, I hike fast. I want to get to camp. I want to get to the viewpoint. Um, sometimes just so I can sit and relax, but, um, I, and I think I would struggle with that on an exceptionally long trail because I would constantly be trying to keep to a schedule and I would, you know, constantly be looking forward to, okay, I need to get here next. And I know about myself when I do that, I sort of lose sight of the present and what's around me right now in this moment and this day and getting to enjoy the views and being able to, you know, stop and rest at the, the, the Alpine Lake or, um, the, the beautiful view and stretch a hammock somewhere, you know? Um, so that's, you know, I, that's just what I know about myself. Yeah. And I had to learn for myself. So I was, I had always been a very goal-driven person. I was always, you know, set goals, you know, have a, you know, a, B and C to do. My background is in municipal planning. Uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, that's kind of the way I'd function for a good part of my adult life. And on, when I went out on the long trail for the first time, yeah, I just had this kind of just this change where this is not the place for, at least where I'm concerned, for goals, right? I'm going to hike for two weeks, three weeks. Well, I'll, I don't know how many miles I'm going to hike. I don't know exactly where I'm going to finish, but I want to just be in the moment. Appreciate the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. And that makes me think you're like, I, this fall, hopefully, um, I'm not a planner, so Usually like this fall is now, oh, I might do it in three weeks. I don't know. Um, <laughs> is I, I now live very close to um, the Ozark Highlands Trail in Northwest Arkansas and the Wachita Trail uh, that stretches Arkansas and a bit of Oklahoma. And those are much shorter trails, like 200 to 300 miles. And um, those I look at, I'm like, oh, okay. Now if we're talking through hiking, um, you know, a week, a couple of weeks, um, and done that, that I could enjoy, you know, um, being out there for a limited amount of time, uh, and knowing that I'll be back to civilization soon and, um, can get back to work and still have sort of the freedom and time to enjoy the, the journey, if you will. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you, know, you and I have experienced backpacking and it sounds like, like me, you have a a good handle on what your threshold is for being mm -hmm. out there. And I have to wonder, you know, people see movies like Wild or Walk in the Woods, which neither of those characters actually through hiked, right? That's the irony of that. <laughs> and people say, yeah, I want to go out and through hike those long trails. I, let me know what you think about this. That maybe before, and, and not for everybody, but maybe what some people need to do before they bite something like that off is learn what your threshold is. Maybe you're okay doing those 50 mile or two or 300 mile trails. Yeah, I think um, obviously everybody is different, but I never think it's a bad idea to like start small and sort of dip your toe in the water. And I, I say the same thing when I'm, um, you know, talking to new backpackers or writing articles about how to get started in something, which I do frequently for, for other publications. Um, you like to start small. You don't have to like <laughs> a through hike does not need to be your first backpacking trip. In fact, when I find out that, you know, like, oh, I started the AT. That was the first time I backpacked. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and those people, you know, occasionally even frequently finished that trail. Um, but to me for, I think for most people, 
a reasonable goal is to dip your toe, like start with a weekend backpacking yeah. trip. And then if you want to be a through hiker, do something shorter, like um, start with the Trans Catalina Trail in Cal California, which I did with uh, my same friend, my same friend from the PCT. Uh, we did the Catalina Trail in March. Um, and that takes, you know, like four days, three or four days. Uh, go to the Ozark Highlands Trail, take a week on the Buffalo River Trail, or I mean, there are so many trails out there that are, uh, you know, 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles, not 2000 miles. Right. Um, and it's, it's never a, a bad idea to test test out your metal, I guess, first on something shorter. And if you love it and you want more of that, then go do a huge trail. And if not, you've learned something about yourself and you stick with the shorter trails and there's nothing wrong with that either. Because right, there's stories of people that set out, as you said, for their first trip, their first backpacking trip is maybe the ambitions to through hike the AT, spend a lot of money on gear, yeah, have high expectations and share them with everybody. And then after two or three weeks, they don't like it and maybe never backpack again. And when I hear that, I think, like you said, start off with smaller ones. I, I like to tell people, you know, there are so many trails that are maybe just five mile trails to get to a bat, to get to a campsite. Mm -hmm. Make sure you, I was a scout leader for over 22 years. And, and I used to let the parents know, I used to so, you know, here are the expectations. We're going to like, we're going to have your kids experience and we're going to give them experience. We're going to allow them to experience backpacking. Some of them might not like it, but these short trips that we take leading up to the week long track trip, that's how we're going to find out. We're not going to just throw them out there for a week and then have him come home and say, I hated this. Because I have at least one boy over that course of the five years I was leading those trips say, you know what? I like one and two night trips, but I, I don't like the idea of going for five nights in a row. And that's I, I said, that's fine. I said, yeah, I said, that's fine. Some yeah. people that's, they're okay with that. That's good. That doesn't make you any less an outdoors person, camper or backpacker than your peers who are going to go out for five days. Right. Yep. And I've, I've uh, brought out some of my friends uh, for camping and backpacking. And even this, this past um, March, I took out a couple of my friends who were pretty brand new to backpacking. And at the end, they both had a great time, but one of them was like, I think, I think three nights is my max of you know, like sleeping in a tent. Like that was, that was fun, but I think three nights from now on. <laughs> and I was like, right. okay, there you go. You, you pushed yourself or maybe I pushed you and <laughs> you, uh, you learned about yourself that you are happy doing two or three nights of camping outdoors. And that's great. So now you can enjoy yourself more knowing that that's the perfect amount of time. <laughs> and there's benefits to shorter trips too, right? Bring more exciting food. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> As you know, right? The yeah. food you eat on a two or three week trip is a lot different than what you're going to eat on an overnight. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right. you know, you're going to pack ways, the heavier. Right, right. You might, you might pack that camp chair because you're thinking, well, it's only an overnight. I'll, I can... I can handle a little extra weight. Don't think I want to carry two extra pounds for three or four weeks, but I'm okay overnight or two nights. No, yeah, not me. I'm an I'm an ultra lighter, so uh, uh, a chair maybe, maybe for one night if I'm going like five miles. <laughs> I've been asked that question when I've been interviewed. Yeah, do I bring a chair? Because I think that's kind of like maybe creeped into the conversation when you start talking about pack weight and lightweight. Yeah, yeah. do you or shouldn't you bring a chair? Right. And, and I, I always just say, I haven't yet, I'm considering it, but being somebody who leans towards ultralight, my pack weight is typically, my base weight's typically between 10 and 12, 12 and a half pounds. This year I carried a bear canister with me. So I was even closer to 13, but I always, I'm always trying to push to get to 12 or get to 10 pounds. So when I'm ready to make that dive into buying a chair, I'm like, ah, it kind of goes against what I, what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Yeah. I, um, I joke that I have to be an ultra lighter. It's not a choice. It's a, it's a necessity because I weigh all of 105 pounds. And so if I'm carrying a 30 pound pack with food and water, like things are just, things get out of control quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very comfortable. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable 
very quickly. So I, I joke that I have to be like, I don't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> I started backpacking in the seventies when the gear by nature was just very heavy. Mm -hmm. So going yeah, by the time the eighties rolled around, the manu gear manufacturers were making lighter gear, better materials, lighter fabrics. So I kind of always had that in the back of my mind, but I had knee surgery in 2007. I had my first knee surgery. So yeah, by, for me, it was by necessity as well. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, I'm in my forties at that time I was in my forties. And I was like, if I want to continue backpacking, I'm going to have to really go all in on, on ultra light or, you know, reducing my pack weight. Or as I like to tell friends, putting my backpack on a diet. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's the, I mean, there's, there's also a huge pricing disparity oh. between, um, backpacking, lightweight backpacking, and then ultra light backpacking. Um, that I, I was joking recently with somebody that the price to go from backpacking to lightweight backpacking is a little extra. You're gonna, you're gonna shell out a bit more money, but if you want to go from lightweight backpacking to ultra light backpacking like pull out the credit card because <laughs> you, you're about to shell out some dough for well, i mean like what's an ounce worth is is i guess the question what is an ounce worth <laughs> well i've talked about that on the podcast right my crazy little formula ounces per dollar right dollar per, you know what's it going to cost me right? and again back to the whole idea backpack being on a diet and i'm at that yeah. point now is there a way i can lose those last two pounds right when somebody's on a diet i have two more can i lose those last couple of pounds and that's where i've been at for now three years can i uh, shave off those last few pounds and and you're right about the money end of it right mm -hmm. i'm using a sleeping pad right now that weighs 18 ounces for mm -hmm. me to go down to a quality pad that has a significant weight difference it's like a 200 200 dollar investment compared to my 55 dollar pad that i'm using yep yeah it's a it's a huge difference um i'm i'm actually about to I've got a closet full of gear here that uh for terra drift i am my husband and i are producing a video that will be sort of testing out some of the most ultralight gear we could get our hands on um and taking it out with like no posh things just like the base ultralight gear and, you know, comparing how it performs. Cause obviously, you know, like ultralight is not for everyone. Um, and it, you know, it shouldn't be, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, right. but if it is something you want to do, it's like, you have to figure out if it's worth it, not only the cost, but are you going to buy all this stuff and then realize, Oh my gosh, this is so uncomfortable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or I want, I want a mommy bag, you know, not a quilt. Um, I'm going to, you know, pay a few extra ounces for that, but whatever, that's what makes me comfortable. So that I, that's going to be a fun video. <laughs> yeah. I'd be looking forward to that because yeah, it comes down. Yeah. I think you hit that point where, you know, how many ounces are you willing to sacrifice for comfort? Mm -hmm. Right. How far are you willing to go with that? Like there was a time I could get away with a foam pad, mm -hmm. but you know, after a few nights of being in a lean-to, I mean, a few years of bringing my foam pad into lean-tos, I was like, you know what? All right, I'm going to give up the ounces. I want to be comfortable, and I got an inflatable mattress. Um, and then there's the other side of it. Some of you is not an experienced backpacker. The lighter the gear, the more care you have to take with it. It's true. And I spoke to somebody that let, leads uh, inner city youth on backpacking trips, and yeah, they're using heavier, it's quality, quality backpacks, quality sleeping bags, but heavier, less expensive because let's face it, teenagers, they're going to roll into camp that they're just going to throw that bag down. And I, and I spent enough time in scouting to see what, what youth can do to tents, you know, how many <laughs> tents I've had to repair over the years. And yeah, it's like you, you give that, you give a 12 year old or a 13 year old an ultralight shelter and that thing's going to be shredded in a day or two. Yes, absolutely. And I like, that's another thing that I write about frequently. And we talk about in our videos on Terra Drift is the, the, there are cons to ultra light gear other than just obviously the cost of it is that it often requires more upkeep and maintenance and you do have to take more care with it. So if, you know, you're going out and throwing stuff around all over the place or, um, you don't, 
you don't have the time or the capacity to learn how to patch or repair your gear, which I personally think everybody should learn how to repair all of their gear because it's so easy. Um, but if you're not going to take the time to do that, or you need this tent to last you years and years and years, decades, then ultralight, you know, has, has its cons in that department. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're, and you're right. Is it, you, yeah, that's a part of it. You need to know how to take care of your gear. Mm-hmm. Right. You have to have that knowledge. If you get that little hole in the floor of your tent or shelter, well, you need to know how to fix it, to stretch it out. You're spending several hundred dollars on the shelter because let's face it, if you go in ultralight, you're not going to just go online and find something for a hundred dollars. Right. right. Uh, so yeah, I'm going through that now. I have a tent that I think could be nearing the end of its, of its life expectancy, but I've got you know, this year I had to put a little piece of tenacious tape on it. Cause I saw a little rip and I saw I'll get another year or two out of this, I think. Oh, definitely. I, I heartily endorse um, gear repair and I, I take a lot of pride in it, actually. Um, I have purchased used gear um, that was super cheap because it had a little tear in it. Like I got a big Agnes ultralight tent for half off at an REI, <laughs> words, at an REI garage sale um, a few years ago because it had a little tear in it. And I was like, I have patches for that. <laughs> I, have, I have a box full of patches for different kind of fabrics and re-waterproofing detergents and sprays and boot cleaners and uh, zipper lubricant. I have everything. I have it all in a little box. I'm like, here it is. I've got jackets with patches on them. And I think that's that's part of not just stretching your dollar, right? Which is very important to, to most people, but also sustainability. Um, keeping gear that still has plenty of life left in it out of landfills uh, because this stuff is all synthetic. So it's not biodegrading uh, in, you know, a couple months or something. It's around for years and years. And so there's that component, but there's also the, you know, the new gear component where all of this gear is being manufactured out of virgin materials. Um, So every time you chuck a tent that has a hole in it, Uh, that you could have patched you're also buying a new tent and the cycle continues so it's it's incredibly it's an incredibly sustainable choice to choose to repair little things in your gear and usually it's absolutely possible to do those minor repairs and easy and cheap um so it's a great idea all around (laughs) yeah when you look at the bigger picture of the ethos of most people who enjoy the outdoors you're right the bigger picture is you know, I, like I had a, I've had a couple of situations like this. Most recently I had a jacket that I love this jacket. It's warm, comfortable. I bought it at a secondhand store. Okay. Like 15 years ago. So when the zipper broke last year, my wife was like, you bought it used. You've had it for 15 years. I a new jacket. I said, no, I could get this zipper replaced. I said, I, you know, it couldn't be fixed. I said, but if we bring it up the street to this interest, I'm sure she'll just put a new zipper on there for me. And I said, yeah, I, I, that's what I did. And I did the same thing with a backpack. The pockets ripped. I do a lot of bushwhacking and the, I had like the mesh pockets and they were starting to get too many tears on them. And mm-hmm. it went through my mind. Oh, it'd be cool to get a new backpack. Everybody likes getting new gear, right? Opening it right. up. And I said, you know what? I want to stretch this out. I, I I was able to get them fixed. But yeah, when I'm listening to you, I'm like, yeah, this this falls into, you know, we, we all want to have to leave no trace. So stretch that out. Look at a bigger picture. And things like repairing our gear here looking for used stuff that was probably going to be discarded and i'll share this with you alicia i grew up not too far from camp i don't know if you're familiar with camp but they're located yeah. in new jersey yeah they were like industry leaders years ago yeah before I my, dad always, and all the, my dad always had the the um the little the camp catalog used to come in yeah catalogs <laughs> yeah uh yeah my my oldest son jokes with me about that sometimes dad that catalog would come in and you'd be sitting there looking at it from cover to cover <laughs> <But> <laughs> I lived close enough where I could go in there and shop. And, and back then they had a big showroom where you can actually get into the tents. And, you know, if you were going to buy a sleeping bag, they'd take it out and say, well, get in it, make sure you're comfortable, et cetera. But when you walk through the front door, they had, sometimes they'd have boxes of things that were returned. So before I shopped around the store, I always rummaged through that box. And I still have things I bought years ago 
that I bought out of those boxes. That's awesome. Yeah. I usually, I go into an REI, which is, you know, a candy store for me. Um, <laughs> it's just this giant toy store. People don't understand uh, that if they don't do this though. Yeah. Yeah. I go into an REI and was like, Oh, so excited all of a sudden. But my first, my first stop is always like, where is the REI garage sale section? Um, since they stopped doing the major events, um, which they used to do multiple times a year. Now they like every store has their own garage sale section, um, which is awesome because I, I go there first. And I'm like, is there anything that I need? Can I get it used? You know, something that somebody returned and I've found some awesome stuff um, over the years, but I also love to see people's repaired gear like out in the wild. Yeah. Um, I think my, my friend that I hiked part of the PCT with, she had some rips in some of her, stretchy pockets and she loves that pack she hiked the at with it um she finished up the pct with it and she was just like i this i'm not ready to let it go yet it was it's gonna be time soon but <laughs> based on the wear but um there was a tent there that was like repairing gear and they stitched up her pockets and she was thrilled and i was thrilled for her and i just love to see older gear out there that's been patched and repaired because you know somebody loves that and it's it must have such good memories in it hmm. that you know like people are still carrying things that have six patches on it and have been sewn up four times and <laughs> all of that so my dad's still was carrying up until last summer I think we finally convinced him to upgrade um because it, it's just not functional anymore but he's still using like a an aluminum pot and kettle set that he's had since at least I was a child. Um, I don't, I don't know if it's pre Alicia, but <laughs> um, it's, it's old and dented. And we teased him about it because we're like, you know, there, there are more compact options now to add. <laughs> but I also took a picture of him using it. And I was like, I, I'm actually, I'm really impressed with you. <laughs> You're still using this old gear, you know, cause it's been on so many trips with you and every patch and stain and tear has like a story. And I, I just love seeing that stuff out there. Yeah. I could tell you this as somebody who's, you know, probably your father's age or me, you know, and, and probably in, of his generation, at least, mm -hmm. I think what happens is those things become anchors. Like you said, there's the, the memories that are attached to them. I have gear I bought when I was in high school. that's still around a couple of pieces that are still around. Um, when I was teaching, when I was preparing youth for uh, backpacking trips, you know, I would go through all the different types of backpacking stove and then, stoves, and then I would take out this propane stove that was considered a backpacking stove in the 70s and in the early 80s. And I'd say, feel how heavy this thing is, you know, and then I'd bring out that big one pound propane stove. <laughs> and I said, yeah, th this was this was state of the art in 1979. <laughs> That's awesome. But I still I have think... it. I, I I don't carry it with me on backpacking trips anymore, though. I take it car camping to, for boiling water for coffee. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I think I, it was either backpacker or outside. I, they're, most of the content is shared between the sites now. Um, they're owned by the same company. But uh, they just ran an article comparing gear from the 70s yes. to gear today and did like a pass fail and like whether or not you know, people would still, the writer would still consider using the gear from the seventies or if like, absolutely not. And I think, I think most of the items, he was like, no, no, thank you. <laughs> he or she, I don't remember who they wrote it. <laughs> I, it was a, it was a heat or I'm trying to think who it is. Anyway, the, I'm interviewing them. I think it's next week. Nice. I love that. I'll, yeah. uh, I'll have to listen into that one. <laughs> I, I peruse outside in Backpacker ma Magazine looking for guests. So. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, back. Well, you know what? I give Backpacker Magazine and Outdoor Magazine. I, I I always give them their mention. So they can't get mad at me for poaching guests from them. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're talking about, you know, gear we become anchored to. And it's ultralight backpackers. Sometimes it's, you know, you're always looking for ways we can, how can we replace this? I mean, we talked about that, right? I've got my air mattress. Do you mm -hmm. have that piece of gear in your kit right now that you're thinking, all right, I can replace this. I could do a little bit lighter or more, maybe there's a more efficient way I can be doing this. Always. Um, the problem with being a gear tester is that you end up with too much of it. 
And <laughs> so like what I am backpacking with now, I wasn't even backpacking with a year ago um, because so much comes in and I'm testing and reviewing things that uh, not everything, but a lot of it gets swapped out. Um, right now, I, I just got in a, um, what is it? A Thermarest ultralight sleeping pad and it is light <laughs> and I'm because I before getting it I was actually considering trying out just the foam sleeping pad I was like I'll just bring my my z rest out and I'm gonna try it out for like three nights and see if I can get used to just sleeping on the foam pad um but I got this thing and it's like uber light um it may actually be lighter than the z rest uh so I'm pretty stoked about testing that out but I I discovered I love an ultralight backpack um which is one of the 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 heaviest things you can swap out I mean that right there um probably saved me three pounds when I started just using ultralight packs um the one I've used most recently is a gossamer gear um mariposa or gorilla it's the gorilla but uh love love an ultra light pack um i have several like in the hopper that i'll be testing soon um i'm i'm playing with swapping a canister stove with an alcohol stove which is kind of like i guess sort of the the number one th I don't want to say the number one because it absolutely depends on where you're hiking, right? Because if you're on the PCT, there no alcohol stove. <laughs> that's a that's a no go um, in burn ban regions. But um, you know, getting I've always gone with the canister stove, usually because it's Josh and I, and so we're like, well, easy way to boil a lot of water. Um, but I've been playing around with the alcohol stove recently to to cut that weight. Um, so, so that's an item. I'm always like, can I bring just an extra large mug, titanium mug that I can eat out of and then drink out of, or do I need both a mug and a pot? Um, I, I think I might have a little bit of a masochistic streak. Like I want to see <laughs> how stripped down I can get my kit mm -hmm. before I just am utterly miserable <laughs> so it's a fun game that I play every time I I pack my back how many layers do I really need <laughs> well I think a lot of us go through that anybody that, there's a lot of backpacking right you know I come home start going through my stuff and sometimes it's right out on the trail laying in a tent saying well did I really need to bring this or can I get oh, by yeah. with this on the next trip instead <laughs> and uh and the backpack thing, uh, you know, I have I bought my backpack in 2007 it's a go light they don't even make them I think the company's out of business now or it was bought out and, uh, you know, it doesn't have load lifters and a couple other things that have now come out since then. And every year I'm about ready to buy one. And I'm like, I tried another pack and didn't like it. I went back to the go light. And it's, it's becoming a joke between my wife and I now. It's like, you know, you talk about this every year looking for a new pack. I said, I know, but it's so, I, I can't get, can't bring myself to not using. I just, I, 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 it's comfortable. And it's like, I'm afraid if I buy something else, I'll spend all that money and maybe not like it. But, yeah yeah absolutely you, it's you, you're tempting the allure of the new gear <laughs> yeah something bright and shiny that excitement yeah. of when the box gets dropped off on the porch although frankly when when i get brand new gear i'm almost a little embarrassed and like i said i get new gear a lot because we test and review it but i'll go out on the trail and i'm like oh my bag's really clean uh, people are gonna think I'm new at this <laughs> and so I I have been known to like drop my bag in the dirt or like sit directly in a mud puddle or something just drag things through the dirt I'm like okay see nobody will think I'm new at this anymore <laughs> that's right <laughs> I, I'm not that newbie out there if you see me right. setting up my shelter don't feel like you gotta run over and help me I, you know, exactly. I've done this before <laughs> I it's, it's even worse with um I'm a big fan now of undyed gear. Uh, so it's just completely white gear, which is very sustainable uh, because the synthetic dyeing process is quite toxic and very water intensive. And I wrote a, a whole article about that for um, for outside. But 
ever since writing that and learning some of the stats and things, I've been really into undyed gear and not a ton of manufacturers make it and offer it yet. I hope uh, it's, it seems to maybe sort of be catching on, but you, a bright white piece of gear, like a sleeping bag or a pack or something shows up. And I'm like, Oh, that's, we got to get that dirty as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get some miles on that. Make yeah, that look let's, used. <laughs> let's roll in put the some, dirt. Let's go sleep. Put outside. some natural dye on that. <laughs> some yeah, natural right. brown or, or black dye on that. <laughs> Rub some brown. berries in it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you do a lot of gear reviews. And now I've been asked, you know, some people have said to me, you know, why don't you do gear reviews? And the truth is I don't because I use my gear, as you can probably catch on by now, until it's falling apart, until it absolutely can't be used anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you know, you're in a position when people read your gear reviews, you're you're getting this gear and you're you're actually testing the gear, you're taking it out there and using it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like with me, I, I, I could give my opinion on something. But, you know, you're, you're out there actually testing it. And I've told people to try to resist the uh, temptation to watch a bunch of YouTubes on people that are doing gear reviews, because a lot of times it's somebody that, well, that's their backpack. That's the backpack they've bought. It might be their first or only, or maybe their second backpack. So what do they really have to, have to compare it to? And I put mm -hmm. myself in that position. I couldn't do a, 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 a review on a backpack. I've, in my life, I've probably, I could probably count how many I've owned. But you're out there. You can actually do very objective and comparative reviews. We try. <laughs> <laughs> there are, um, I'm a naturally sort of, I don't want to say a positive person because I'm definitely a pessimist, but <laughs> I get very excited about new technologies. I'll say that. And so when, you know, somebody sends me a backpack or a sleeping bag or shoes or something like that, like I get very excited if there's new technology involved, like they're undyed or they're, um, they have some very innovative uh, storage features or um, it's extra lightweight or the, insulation, the synthetic insulation is made of uh, biodegradable materials. And so <laughs> I think that definitely comes out in the reviews is this, <laughs> I've, I've been referred to as a cartoon character in YouTube reviews, because I, I can tend to be a bit effervescent, I think, but um, I get really excited about that stuff. And uh, so when I take it out to test it, uh, I do have to make a point of being objective be like, okay, but actually this feature was not great <laughs> mm -hmm. um, compared to this bag or this bag and eh, this bag, you know, not that innovative or not that functional or this pocket system wasn't great. Um, that's just something I, um, we just shot a review today for a backpack. I was like, ah, the water bottle pockets, not convenient. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, but yes, we, we get out there, we test it, we get it dirty um, and kind of compare it to what else is out there, but also said sort of the point, not just being, Hey, buy new gear, but if you're going to buy new gear, if it's time to buy the new gear, like, let us help you figure out if this is the right gear for you. Uh, so there is a lot of that aspects to our, our reviews is that, okay, so I like zero drop shoes. So these boots aren't my favorite, but if you like ankle support, you'll probably love these, that sort of thing. Um, so that, you know, we're, we don't want people to just buy things and them to go to waste because they didn't like them or they tried them once and they're like, Ugh, uncomfortable, throw them away. Um, you know, we want people to buy thoughtfully. Um, and preferably only when they need new gear, like when their backpack is deteriorating, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or their tent has a three foot long tear in it, which, okay, now it might be time to get a new tent. <laughs> right. We might not be able to fix that. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, you differentiate between your personal preference and what we really need to know. Right. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And you brought right. up shoes. I, I like the yeah. Yeah. And shoes are the toughest thing. That has to be the toughest thing to review, I would think. Right. I hate when people ask me, Do you have a shoe you can recommend? 
Yeah. I don't know your foot, man. <laughs> <laughs> what works for me, you might hate. Your foot might be uncomfortable. In. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we, we do try to very much do, like, even if we didn't like something, like we've tested things that I wouldn't take hiking or backpacking um because it was too heavy or it was too clunky or just like the features weren't there for me but I try to look at it from the perspective of okay but if you're this kind of person you may actually love this feature or what have you um because we want to be as helpful as possible so we're not just um sort of appealing to one group of people that's just like us <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> All right. yeah. Alicia, I'd like to move on now and talk about your business. Um, I'd mentioned it in the introduction. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's uh, Terra Drift. Tell us about Terra Drift. Yeah. So it, it started out, funnily enough, as a budget travel blog. <laughs> um, and that over a couple of years morphed into um well we actually spend most of our time when we travel playing outside so maybe this shouldn't be a budget thing it should be an outdoors thing um and it became terror drift like what it is today which is sustainable travel and outdoor adventure so any travel aspect we're talking about where to go to play outside what you can do in California besides go to the beach like let's go hiking let's go backpacking let's go mountain biking um so we do a lot of destination sort of highlights and things to do in obscure places that you may not have heard of before and how they're epic things to do there um and then we produce the gear reviews video reviews and written we compare gear um like rain jackets and uh synthetically insulated puffy jackets uh but then we also talk about why synthetically insulated puffy jackets um you mentioned you know, like terror drift is is a vegan channel but you don't have to be vegan to enjoy the channel um we just mention when things are vegan because sometimes as a, a vegan um it's harder to find shoes uh uh, especially in the hiking world, because they either contain leather or animal-based glues and things like that. So we want to point out, hey, this shoe is for you. And if you're not vegan, it doesn't matter. It's also for you. <laughs> Anybody can wear this shoe. Um, but also, you know, like what to eat when you're out there is is a big deal. Um, although there are way more vegan backpacking meals, like freeze-dried stuff on the shelves than there used to be, uh, which is awesome. But you know, we, we point that sort of thing out, but, um, also talk, talk about the, the pros of, uh, synthetic insulation over down and like the sustainability argument of leather, uh, versus, um, synthetics, uh, and that sort of thing. So the, the idea behind Terror Drift is to be a fun, quirky, little bit snarky, <laughs> entertaining place to, learn about sustainability in the outdoors from like how to get started backpacking to you know, like hiking tips and tricks to where to go and what to do and of course gear reviews of generally speaking more sustainable gear is what we focus on mm -hmm. and it's great that more and more resources are being made available to newbies the mm -hmm. people who are a little nervous about doing this i think that's great but on the sustainability side of this, I think gear manufacturers, they, you know, let's face it, they're in business. They're in this to make money. And if they start to hear that there's a demand for, for these products, they're going to answer that. They're going to respond to that. There's the old adage, we vote with our wallets. Yep. And, you know, it comes down to that. And if they start to see that more and more people in the backpacking community, this is what they're looking for. They don't need four or five different colors of the same backpack or eight different colors of the same sleeping bag. They just need something that's functional and environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. Ideally. <laughs> yeah, right. And I think uh, gear manufacturers are taking note that more people are wanting this because even from when we started 
really focusing on gear reviews um, maybe two years ago, two or three years ago, um, we've seen way more sustainable gear and you know sus sustainability is a spectrum um there's more sustainable gear and less sustainable gear but every little bit matters and so we like to point out the okay like this is made with recycled materials this is undyed um here's why that matters as well um i'm a very <laughs> maybe it's because i'm a journalist i'm a i'm a why based person i need to know why um my mom would also tell me growing up as a teenager, I was defiant, compliant. Like I, I would, I didn't want to follow the rules, but I would, especially mm -hmm. if you told me why those rules were important. <laughs> so we talk about why this stuff matters a lot and like, okay, I'm going to tell you to buy a pack made of recycled plastic bottles or, um, undyed, an undyed sleeping bag, but here's why not just me telling you to buy more stuff. <laughs> we should be questioning everything though. You know? And the fact that you're giving the why you're doing us all a service. You're not just saying do this because yeah. we all should be questioning it. If you just say, do this, we all should be questioning you. Why are you telling us to do this? And then, but you're giving us the answer. And that's mm -hmm. important. You know, I, 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 I told my kids all the time, ask questions. There's nothing wrong with questioning something. Do it in the right way. <laughs> question it you know don't be that guy that's just trying to be funny in class to question something but <laughs> it's okay even with your teachers if you hear something that just doesn't sound right question it mm -hmm. love it alicia do you have anything any big adventures coming up anytime soon i know well you're in california so it doesn't really get i don't know what part of california you're in but i was just out there and i loved it but anything coming up any adventures coming up well, I was only visiting California recently. I actually am based um, just recently uh, in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so that was a that was a big move from before that. We were in Austin, Texas for quite a number of years. So Arkansas is a little bit different. Um, <laughs> but we, I, I, I am planning um, hopefully next month uh, backpacking. Um, the Buffalo River Trail, um, which is kind of a little through hike that overlaps the Ozark Highlands Trail, um, might take about five days to a week. Um, just kind of, I feel like I need to explore my new playground here, um, especially since moving, we've we focused a lot on mountain biking <laughs> because this is sort of a huge mountain biking um, mecca. Uh, here in like the Bentonville to Fayetteville area. And um, so we've got that going on. We're we're going to go do some kayak camping in the Everglades um, later this month. Um, honestly, like all of our adventures are so poorly planned. <laughs> Usually we don't know where we're going until like the month before. Uh, my mom sent me a, um, a message a couple weeks ago. Uh, I mentioned that we started going on backpacking trips together, um, the four of us, every summer almost now. And she sent me a message a couple weeks ago about, hey, how did these dates work for um, going to the the Tetons and and hiking, a, you know, summoning a couple of the Tetons? And they were dates in June. And I just, woman, who do you think I am? <laughs> I love you, mom, but come back to me in six months. <laughs> I can't. I, well, I if we over plan it, is it really an adventure if we go out there and plan it mile for mile, day for day, <laughs> day to day? I mean, part of the adventure is not knowing, right? Exactly. right? You know, this is, we I know where we're going down. to start. Right? <laughs> That's part of what makes it an adventure. Right, right. You set the dates and then remind me of them. Two or three months before, and right. that'll I'll be show fun. up with my and I'll show up with my gear, and you know we'll yeah. put one foot in front of the other, and exactly. wherever we're going, we'll get there when we get there. I'll meet you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah for some we, know, we always have fun stuff coming up. <laughs> for some, for some reason, I was thinking you were in California because you were talking about all the hikes you did in California. Oh, but at least I had yeah. it right there in a warm weather area, which allows yeah, you to I, uh, do year round activities. I I ended up in um, California twice twice already this year um which was kind of a surprise but it was a blast hiking in on Catalina Island which was beautiful and um and then I just got back from a, a week-long trip 
played at like Yo Yo oh, words again Yosemite facelift and um, some of the actual local events around there. So that was really fun. Got to do some hiking and mountain biking around sort of like North Central California. But um, yeah, Austin year round, nice weather. Although uh, frankly, it's it's nice to be out of an area where every campground is booked six months in advance. Uh, it's much nicer up here. <laughs> Well, year round where I live means you better have snowshoes and some <laughs> and winter clothing. But you know, I I started doing winter hiking. I haven't done any winter backpacking, but I'm doing winter hiking for it. about five years now, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. Just totally different experience. You can it go is. to a place you've been to, in the other seasons, and it's you know when it's covered with snow. Or one of my favorite things is hiking when there's actually snow coming down. That's a lot of fun too. We did that um, last year, I, I guess for the first time we, Josh and I both grew up in Ohio, um, which is obviously cold and gets snow, but um, not a lot. And it turns to slush quickly. Um, we moved away in like 2012. Um, so it's been a minute, but um, maybe there's that sort of childlike joy of snow days, you know, and remembering that sort of thing. But last mm -hmm. winter we went on our first proper planned winter backpacking trip um, in Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. And it was snowing when we hiked out there and it was beautiful and it was cold. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the next day we hiked, we, you know, backpacked in the snow and um and then just did some some snowshoeing um like around while we sort of road tripped around Colorado and Utah and um, New Mexico. So, so much fun. And we joked frequently that we might be the only Texans who owned snowshoes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that couldn't have been easy to do to, to buy snowshoes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. sure your local EMS or REI didn't have snowshoes. <laughs> they they did not. Um, <laughs> fortunately, we were testing some out. So uh, they had to send them from probably very far away. I remember the email because like, oh, we're doing some snow adventures. We could, we'd love to test out these, these snowshoes. And um, they looked at our shipping address and they were like, are, they, they actually asked, are you planning a trip somewhere? Or how are you going to test these? <laughs> of course I'm planning a trip. Like I live in Texas. It, it snowed the one time. Like <laughs> <laughs> it was very funny though. <laughs> We're ordering these just in case this is that year that we get enough snow to use them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ugh. Hopefully not that again. That was that was terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I read enough. Yeah. I, I interviewed somebody that was down there while that was going on. That yeah, that was mm -hmm. tough. Mm -hmm. Alicia, where can we find you if we want to uh, follow you? Absolutely. Well, we're on um pretty much all the socials on uh Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok um at terra drift uh, on all of those and that's terra you know latin for earth drift one word and same with terradrift.com that's kind of the blog where everything sort of lives um lots of written content and comparisons and links to our youtube videos and stuff like that and um and then we're on youtube which is youtube.com slash terra drift and um that's that's where you get to see my smiling face dish about gear all day long <laughs> right. um and then we have uh we actually are just oh, we just launched a backpacking 101 course as well um which is i'm particularly excited about because we we've been working on it for a long time um, months now on and off and um it's it's that resource that you know you were talking about earlier for beginner backpackers to come and learn pretty much everything they need to know to get started backpacking or to get started planning their own trip, you know, by themselves instead of with, you know, the friend who has all the gear and the, the knowledge. Um, so it's, you know, our same terror drift personality in one tidy little package, um, to just like learn everything from leave no trace to how to choose sustainable gear to feed yourself in the outdoors and at all of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I would say this about a beginner backpacking course. We also just look at it. I know I do. When I see something like that, you know, things change. 
I don't want to pretend I know everything. So I'm always yeah. curious. Is there something yep. new? And I usually walk away with at least something I could say, right, let me try that. You know, there's something totally. I didn't think of. Yeah. I, and I hope that's the case because we share a lot of personal experiences and like tips that we've learned over the years of, you know, backpacking and multiple, multiple times a year. Um, the, plenty of backpacking trips. Um, and of course, my experience with um, interviewing and writing about people who are even more experienced than me. So, you know, people I've interviewed about winter camping and tips that I've learned from them and about um, how to deal with a snake bite from interviewing um, a venom expert, you know? Uh, so there's so much more than than just like my experiential knowledge built into this course. So hopefully it's not just beneficial for beginners. It's also for like people who want to brush up a little bit or um, think there might be some some tips and tricks in there that that they might want to learn. Well, I encourage everybody to go check out your website, your YouTube channel. I certainly enjoyed looking at your website. Very interesting, very no very good knowledge, very things, things that could be helpful, like I said, to any level of backpacker. We'll have all the links in the description for the podcast for everybody to look at. Uh, Alicia McDars, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing all this with us and uh, maybe have you back on in the future. Give us a little trip report on one of these excursions you're going on. Cause I'm always trying to promote these smaller trails. I always like to tell people there's so many of these cool trails out there that don't get talked about. So, uh, but once again, thanks so much for coming on here and sharing with us. Absolutely. It's my absolute pleasure. Everybody get outside. This is the time of year, especially if you're in the North, get out there, have some fun and be safe.